Will Howard, the quarterback at Michigan, it's not at Michigan, but at Ohio State, can he do it? A lot of other players that are factors, Jalen Milrow, I think you're probably familiar with him, Jackson Dart, Nuss Meyer, but Prentice at Alabama, he better, needs to be big at the wide receiver position. How about the quarterback at uh, number four in the top wide receiver, number 10? Bill Conley joining us, and Bill, uh, great to have you on. We'll go through uh, a lot of the list, but I want to start with with Will Howard because uh, pretty obvious, he better he better have a big year. Uh, he's got the most <laughs> talented uh, compliments around him, but the questions continue to be about him, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it is funny how Ohio State quarterback is kind of the easiest and hardest job in the country at the same time. He's going to have weapons he didn't have at Kansas State. He had a good offense at K-State, but obviously you go to Ohio State, you got five stars everywhere you look, except that means that if you have even one bad game at one key moment, because I mean, last year we, we all kind of bagged on, uh, on, on last year's starter. Well, uh, he basically had one bad game against Michigan, and, and he short-armed a couple throws, and that was all it took to completely derail Ohio State's entire season. So Will Howard has to be pretty much awesome throughout, can't ever have a backward step. Bill, let's uh, move along. I won't go over every name, but I am curious about Jalen Milrow. He had such a big year last year, especially in the second half of the season. What does he need to do for Alabama to be successful? And I mean, late and deep into the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 when I was writing that blurb on him, I, it, it kind of coalesced for me. Like, I don't know if I've ever seen a player do so many, put on so many good displays and bad displays kind of at the same time his his strengths are so strong but his weaknesses were still pretty weak the intermediate passing game just wasn't really there he throws a gorgeous deep ball and and that that you know benefited him pretty well but uh getting a little bit more of a, a of a developed passing tree so to speak i mean now he's playing for one of the best uh, offensive coaches in the country so um you know th- that, that'll probably work out pretty well but he does need to develop in the passing game uh you know if if the if any of those snaps late in the year were his pro were his fault because of communication or whatever that obviously can't happen again either so a few more things to work on there and for him to be successful he he needs uh people to be able to catch the ball. And you mentioned Kobe Prentice there. Uh, I was surprised to see him so high, but uh, explain. Yeah, I mean, he's just by far the most proven option uh, in that Alabama receiving core. He's the only guy from last year's Alabama team returning who caught more than, I think, 15 or 13 passes, something like that, 15 maybe. So, I mean, obviously Bernard from Washington came along, and, and so that gives them another reasonably experienced option. But they're going to be looking for freshmen and sophomores and unproven juniors uh, to step up and make sure that Melrose has what he needs. Prentice is kind of the closest thing to a known entity, and he has to play like it. You got two quarterbacks also from the SEC, uh, Dart at number six and Nussmeyer at number seven. One, one's been around, one has been around a little <laughs> bit, but he played behind a Heisman Trophy winner last year. What about it? Yeah, I mean, Ole Miss, obviously, we, we're, we're really curious about their line play. That's supposedly where they've, uh, you know, added the most pieces and maybe improved the most of this offseason. But Jackson Dart also – it, he's he's been good for a couple of years, but you know if Ole Miss really does have designs and playing at a at, at a top five level, really making an actual title run, he's going to have to kind of get into that top ten. I think he was 16th in total QBR last year. He really probably needs to be top five or ten. He's going to have a good receiving core, obviously, but he needs one more step uh, in his development. And Nussmeyer, yeah, is a, a great situation. Your, your defense wasn't very good last year. The offense had to be pretty much the best in the country to win games, and now, you know, maybe the defense improves, but Nussmeyer has to clear a really, really high bar that his predecessor set. Uh, and he looked really good in the bowl game, but that was, you know, one game. Dylan Gabriel's been around a while, but uh, never with the type of hype and expectations that he'll have this year at Oregon. We talked to Dan Lanning two days ago. He was pretty high on his QB. What about it? Yeah, I mean, obviously his, his arm strength, there, there are certain aspects of his game from a physical standpoint that maybe aren't as impressive as, as other uh, high-level quarterbacks. But, I mean, you're not going to find a more experienced. If, if he kind of 
does what Bo Nix did last year, he's going to end up with more career passing yards than anybody in college football history. Obviously, that includes the 2020 season, so it's kind of an asterisk situation. But he's thrown for so many yards. He's seen so many defenses. Uh, he's seen plenty of big games himself, even though this is obviously kind of a step up now that he's going to be piloting like a, a, the number three team in the country or so. But, yeah, I, I, you cannot ask for more. Uh, a, a guy who's seen more things in his college career than Dylan Gabriel has. We'll see Cam Ward week uh, one, and when we're down in Gainesville, that's three weeks from today. Uh, that's a big first game, but uh, the expectations for him, he's well-traveled. What about uh, what you see in him and what you expect? Yeah, I mean, he's really, really tantalizing. I've seen a lot of people, like, if you're looking around for a, a senior year Jaden Daniels-style leap, he's kind of the first name that people throw out there. And, and it's easy to see why. It just also, he was in a very, very high-volume offense. He was throwing over 40 times a game. Now he goes to play for Mario Cristobal, where even when Mario Cristobal had Justin Herbert, Herbert was throwing like 30 times a game. So it is going to be kind of an interesting seeing how they try to open up the offense for him because I do think – the more you can spread that offense out, the better it goes for him. But uh, it's going to be between him and Martinez and just the general conservatism uh, that, that Mario Cristobal brings to the table. It's going to be, I, I think, a little less conservative uh, play would go a long way for them. Bill, curious about one more play, and that's Dylan Bell, the wide receiver at Georgia, because everyone knows about Carson Beck. Everyone also knows who is no longer there. That's a critical position if the dogs are going to win it all. Yeah, I mean, he, he was he had the most receiving yards over the last month of the year, and obviously guys were in and out of the lineup, but he just in a really small sample, he ended up catching, what, 29 balls all season, but when he looked the part, it looked like you were watching a future All-American. I think his ceiling really is, uh, you know, probably higher than Dominic Lovett's, probably higher than some of the other guys that have uh, some lo level of experience, and so... Yeah, I mean, Georgia's defense is going to be good. Quarterback play is going to be good. Uh, they have a lot to offer, but if he's a legit number one receiver, uh, ready to beat number one cornerbacks in the SEC, it's really it's hard to find any semblance of a weakness for Georgia. Give me something. Oh.